Is it possible to have that kind of wellness for your soul that we just sang about? And not just a wellness for a moment. And not just a wellness for a season, but a wellness for life. And to be in a state of, it is well with my soul. When all the circumstances would uh, scream against. But to be able to say, it is well with my soul, uh, when everything seems to be falling apart, chaos is on the ups, uh, upswing, and... and, and uh, uh, your circumstances are on a downswing, and, and everything seems to be out of sort, can you then say, it is well with my soul? And can I tell you, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you're part of this family through faith in Jesus Christ, then make no mistake, the answer is yes. Now, we don't talk a lot about it because so often we're bound up in the bad news that seems to dominate the headlines of our heart. But the reality is, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you've been brought into God's family through faith in Christ, then God has led you into a place where you have a season of refreshing that lasts from here to eternity. And that's what we want. That's what everybody wants. Everybody wants to experience that refreshing. If you're a marathon runner and you run your 20 plus miles, 26.2 or 26.5, whatever it is, you run your marathon. At the end of that marathon, you want to rest. In fact, at at stations as you're running that marathon, they offer things to refresh you, to energize you so that you can press on and push through the walls that you'll face as you're running that marathon and press you all the way to the finish line. Now, you long to have those moments of refreshing that lead you to that place of refreshing after you hit the finish line. Now, we're on a marathon run, and, uh, and, and maybe it feels like we're running uphill right now, and certainly for people in our culture and in our time today, they feel the weight of this journey in ways that perhaps we have forgotten, but they feel the weight of the journey, and they're looking for something to refresh their soul. And not, not, not just a moment, but they're looking for something to, to soak in their soul and give them the, the joy and the happiness and the peace and the purpose and the fulfillment that all of us desire to have. And so you see them chasing dream after dream after dream and only living a nightmare. You see them escaping from this world in different ways. You see them chasing uh, moments that uh, add a little calm. But, but they need more than a dream that turns into a nightmare. They need more than just a momentary escape. They need more than just a, 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 a refuge uh, on a mountain stream fishing for trout. They, they need more than that. We need more than that. We, we need something to refresh us, to restore us to give us the peace and the joy and the happiness and and the purpose of life that that sticks with us every single day and presses us through to the finish line. We need the Psalm 23 kind of refreshing. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores, refreshes my soul. In Acts chapter 3, we see this picture of people who have been refreshed encountering someone who needs refreshing. And there would be this great transaction of God's grace that takes place in that encounter. And it shows us about us. It teaches us about the church. If you remember, we've been on this journey beginning in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. We looked at how Jesus had spent 50 days with his disciples. He had been raised from the dead, and now as the glorified yet not ascended Lord, he's spending time with his disciples, and he's teaching them, and he's preparing them. Uh, He's preparing the church that he has formed. And he gives them their purpose, their calling. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, You'll receive power, he said, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be witnesses for me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. 
And then Jesus ascended to the right hand of the throne of God, where even today, as our high priest, he makes intercession for us. And then we saw in, in, in chapter 1, verses 11 through 26, how the disciples and the church gathered together and they prayed. And they were praying for the coming of the Holy Spirit. They were preparing themselves for that day in which they would embark upon this calling, this purpose, this mission that God had given them as the church. They got together and they were family. Turn to the person on your right and say, we are family. Turn to the person to your left and say, we are family. Yell up here, we are family. Now, this, this is what God made them to be. The believers gathered together in an upper room in Jerusalem, and they prayed together with one heart, one mind, one voice. They had one purpose, and that is to glorify God by helping others know who Jesus is. And then, last week, we looked in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 41, how <clears throat> on the day of Pentecost... The Holy Spirit fell. The Holy Spirit came with great power and energized the church to fulfill her calling. And, 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 and as the church began to uh, experience this mighty work of, of the Spirit of God, the very presence of God, Peter stood up as representative of the church and he declared to all those who were wondering what in the world's going on here in Jerusalem, and he declared the, the glorious good news of God's rescuing love found in the person of Jesus Christ. And on that day, 3,000 people came to faith in Christ. Then last Wednesday, we looked at Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, and we see that the church fulfills her calling when we disciple those who are saved, when we literally take those who have come to faith in Christ and we baptize them in the name of Jesus Christ, but then we, we do what the church did in Acts 2, 42. And, and they devoted themselves steadfastly. That's a family word. They, they, they gave themselves. They clung together as family. They devoted themselves steadfastly to the apostles' doctrine, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayers. It says that, that the church was gathered together and they were growing in, 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 in who they were as followers of Christ and as the church, as the family that God has created. And they lived as family. They shared life together. Uh, they, they helped each other when they were in need. And, and at the end, it says, and they, 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 they lived together with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. That's the church. That's us. That's you and me. That's First Norfolk. That's what happens when we're family. Now, this family of faith in Jerusalem, this church in Jerusalem, who had experienced refreshing from God through faith in Jesus Christ and the refreshing that comes from God and the very Spirit of God that He gives us as followers of Christ leads the church on a mission to help others find hope and healing. And that's, that's what we do. That's who we are today. We need to understand, first of all, we are family. We are the family of the refreshed. We have experienced the good news of God's rescuing love. We are the sheep that are dwelling in the pasture that, G that God has prepared for us. We're there in the green pastures and we're living by the still waters. And Jesus every day from here to eternity is restoring us and refreshing us. We are the family of the refreshed. And our task our calling is to help those people around us who are far from God, separated from Him by their sin, find hope and healing through faith in Jesus Christ. We are the refreshed who are called to be a refreshing to others. Now, that's our mission. We, as the church, First Norfolk, we fulfill our calling when we help others find healing and hope through Jesus. And that's what we see here in this passage of Scripture in Acts chapter 3. I want you to just uh, walk with me through the first 10 verses, and then we'll, uh, we'll come back to them in a second. But uh, verse 1, Acts chapter 3, verse 1, and Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. Now, now, let's stop for a second. When it says Peter and John, or just says Peter, make no mistake that behind Peter and John are 
the church, is the church. Peter and John are, are, are the apostles, and they represent the church. This isn't me just making it up. This is what scholars have said for 200, 300, 400, 500 years, that Peter and John representing the church become the, the symbol of the church in Jerusalem and throughout the book of Acts. So when you hear about uh, Stephen standing and preaching in a few weeks, we're going to look at that in Acts 7 and 8, uh, you, you hear about Peter standing and preaching. It, it's not just Stephen preaching, it's the church because we are family, we are one body, and we are all in this together. So Peter and John are leading a procession. Here's the image. Peter and John are leading a procession of hundreds upon hundreds of people who have been rescued by God's grace, and the church is going to church. And they're making their way to the temple where they will be praying. It was just an ordinary day of prayer for the church. But God had something greater in store. It goes on and says, um, and and there was, uh, verse 2, that was just one verse. And, And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried... Uh, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful. And he was there to ask alms from those who entered the temple. It was an ordinary day for this man. Every day, since he was a child, a family member or friend would carry him to the gates of the temple. And people passing through perhaps were more inclined to help someone in need This man couldn't walk, and so he's there, and he's begging for money. This is his livelihood. This is how he supports himself. This is food for his table. All right? Verse 3, the the lame man, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on the lame man with John, Peter said, look at us. The lame man gave Peter and John, his attention and expecting to receive something from them. He was saying, okay, well, all right, here's one. Get a little coin from a copper uh, pot. And, and then ver- verse 6, and then Peter said, and you've heard this before if you've been uh, in Sunday school, church training. It says, Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Just an ordinary day for this lame man begging for money. But God had something greater in store. Verse 7, then uh, Peter took the lame man by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, uh, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. By the way, by the way, by the way, it's not just the lame man or the former lame man walking and leaping and praising God. The church, again, hundreds, if not thousands of people who are followers of Jesus, uh, there with Peter and John as they're making their way to pray in the temple. They see what happens. They witness it firsthand. They see this lame man whom they had seen over and over and over and over again, day after day after day, here at this gate, toward the temple, they see him healed, and all of a sudden, they know that he he is healed by the name of Jesus Christ, through faith in Jesus Christ, and the whole crowd begins to sing, and they begin to shout, and they begin to praise God for what God had done in this man's life. Friends, this is who we are. I know some of us, some of us are scared to death to be called hillbillies. Some of us are scared to death to be called uh, um, uh, undignified. Some of us are scared to death to be uh, uh, looked upon as, as some, some uh, uh, fanatic. But can I tell you, when you have experienced the change of life that God has brought to us through the person of Jesus Christ, and you can sit on your hands and sit silent instead of praise the Lord with a loud voice, I got to tell you, I got to wonder if there's something wrong. Have you tasted that God is good? Has it changed your life? Don't you want to say something about it? Don't you want to shout? Instead of trying to be dignified in front of a group of people that should already be shouting with you, 
We need to stand up and we need to shout and we need to declare the praise of the one who has rescued us. And when we see someone else's life change, we need to join in the cacophony of praise that's happening in heaven and we need to lend our voice of celebration. We need to walk with them and leap with them and praise God with them. Friends, it's time. It's time past for us to be dignified people sitting in the silence of our own reverence. Do you think God is pleased when we don't shout our praise to Him, seeing how He has changed our life? Oh, we've relegated worship to something that is not biblical. We think worship is all about silence. Oh, there's a place for silence. There's a place for meditation. Absolutely. But not here. Not now. We've been given a place and an opportunity to praise the Lord. And it doesn't matter if it goes against your tradition. I would suggest that maybe we need to get a little bit more biblical with our tradition. The Bible talks about loud, ringing, shouts, cries of victory and praise to the Lord. Not not this silent stuff that we are so accustomed to. Now, if that gets in your craw and you get a little bit upset with me, I'm I'm okay. For you to talk with me about it. But when you come talk to me, you better bring your Bible. Because that's the foundation of our traditions. This right here. And if there's any other tradition that we hold to that that goes against what we find in this scripture, then we better let it go. And you say, well, pastor, you're turning us into a charismatic church. My goodness, we could use a little bit more charismatic. That's all free. That, that, that's not even in the notes. <laughs> that's just a comment on a verse. That's not, even, that's not even in the notes. All right, so verse 9. All the people saw this man who was formerly uh, lame walking and praising uh, uh, God. And they knew that it was he who sat at, uh, begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Guys, I got to tell you, I I, I believe that what happened there is what can happen. Jesus still changes lives. We sit and we look at people. God's not intimidated by anybody's dark side or wondering eyes. God's not fearful that they're too far out of his reach. God is powerful. He created light in the darkness. He is the one who can take someone, no matter how far they've gone, and bring hope and healing to their life. Jesus still changed his lives. After the 9 o'clock service, a man came up to me, um, and he said, uh, Pastor, um, he might have called me priest, but he called me pastor, I think. And he said, he said, Jesus has changed my life. Jesus has changed my life, and I want to be baptized. You've been talking about baptism. I want to be baptized. I said, yes. I did a little dance. Even Baptists ought to be able to dance when somebody talks about their life being changed. I'm talking to somebody today. I'm just saying. Hey, listen, I get it. I, I, I get it. I do. I get it. I've been raised in it. I can give you chapter and verse of Baptist tradition. But tradition that flies in the face of celebration of Jesus changing lives needs to be put aside. Here's a man who was walking, he was leaping. And he was praising God. It wasn't some silent meditation that he was doing there in the temple. And people began to say, what in the world's happened to him? This man used to hold up his hand for a coin, and now he's been transformed. The guy that was hopeless has found healing through faith in Christ. Those who were refreshed by Jesus became an instrument of refreshing for those who needed Jesus. It goes on, and, and, and we see that the, 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 crowd were, the, the crowd was amazed. And maybe, maybe, just maybe, in a culture that decries absolute truth, in a culture that is uh, so flimsy in, uh, in, in, in uh, objective truth and, and things that the Bible says are clear, we, maybe instead of trying to win an argument, Maybe we should understand that the greatest apologetic of the gospel is 
a church, a family living out loud their faith in Jesus Christ every single day and excited about it. Committed to it, excited about it. That's, that's what we see here. These are the, 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 the crowd was looking and saying, my goodness, there's something crazy happening. So they began to, they began to ask, and, and in that moment, Peter stood up, and, and he understood that this was an opportunity that God had given them, that, that this man who had been hopeless and then healed by faith in Jesus Christ who was singing out loud and being a spectacle for this new life that he found in Christ, had given an opportunity for the church to point the crowd to Jesus. And, and that's, that's how we help others find healing and hope. This is how we help people around us experience the refreshing that God offers as we point them to Jesus. I want you to look at verse 11 and 12. It says, now it's the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John. All the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, and they were greatly amazed. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why do you look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? Verse 13, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the Just One, and you asked for a murderer to be granted to you instead, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are his witnesses. Verse 16, and his name, through faith in his name, he has made this man strong, the lame man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through Jesus has given the formerly paralyzed man this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. You see what Peter did? Peter said, don't look at me. Don't look at, don't look at this church. Look at Jesus. There's only one who can refresh the soul. There's only one good shepherd who leads us to good green pastures and by the still waters and restores our soul. There's only one who can bring us into the family of God. There's only one who died for our sin upon a cross. There's only one who was raised from the dead to give us new life. There is only one servant of the Lord uh, supreme. There is only one holy one and just one. There is only one author of life. His name is Jesus. And even though your sin killed him, he offers you life today. He offers you hope today. He offers you healing today. Peter took that opportunity along with the church to point the crowd to Jesus. Now, you and I, we can fight with culture over different things. We can uh, try to hold on to certain this or certain that, ideas and thoughts and processes or uh, ways of life. We can try to hold on to all those things, and, and, and at different times, that's okay, but if we, the church, and I'm talking about you and me and us and we, if we, the church, point people to a way of life rather than Jesus Christ, we've missed it. We're failing in fulfilling our calling. If, if, if we point people to a moral code that we want them to follow without pointing them to the one who gives them the heart to follow that moral code, we've missed it. And God's given us an opportunity every single day to point people to Jesus because only Jesus can change the heart. And by the way, he wants to. There are people that you encounter every day. There are people in your workplace and in your school. There are people in your neighborhood. There are people you encounter at the cafe or at the grocery store. There are people that you encounter every day, and God wants to change their lives. He wants to overwhelm them with refreshing through the forgiving love that he offers through Christ's death on the cross. And the new life that he gives through Christ's resurrection from the dead. He, he wants their lives to be changed. He wants to change their heart. But how are they going to hear about that unless you tell them? That's what Paul asked in Romans 10. He said, how will they hear unless a preacher tells them? And we are family of the refreshed who have become preachers 
of this truth. As the church points people to Jesus, we don't skimp on the truth of it. And neither did Peter. You see what Peter said? Peter said, this is the Messiah that you've always longed for, talking to a Jewish audience. This is the Messiah that you've been looking for for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. This is the servant of God. This is the very one promised in Isaiah. And you killed him. This is the one who gives life, and you killed him. But even though your sin... And by your sin, you killed the author of life, the prince of life. God still in his grace offers you a chance at forgiveness. Through faith in Jesus. It's not just faith in Jesus. And by the way, it includes faith. You've got to believe that Jesus is your only hope for rescue. But it also includes repentance. That's verse 19. Peter says, repent and be baptized, everyone, that seasons of refreshing may come upon you. And what does he mean? He means you got to turn from your old way of life and turn toward Jesus. This is the message of the church. This is what we share. We're supposed to be telling people that, yes, your sin has separated you from God. Jesus died for your sin. Your sin killed Jesus on a cross. And he's your only hope to experience life. But God raised him from the dead. God raised him from the dead so that you could be forgiven, so that you might have a new life, so that you might be brought into God's family. Oh my goodness, it, 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 it changed Jerusalem again. In, in, in Acts 2, 41, uh, 40 and 41, it says that there were 3,000 people who came to faith in Christ. In Acts 4, verse 1 and 2, it says that now there were 5,000 more who came to faith in Jesus Christ. Because the church was helping others find healing and hope through Jesus. And if that's what happened back then, that's what can happen today. But it's because we, the family of the refreshed, are doing our part. We are the family of the refreshed. That's you and 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 me. So what must we do? Well, the first thing is do what you can with what you have where you are. A simple statement that I heard a long time ago and have held on to it. Do what you can with what you have, where you are. About 10 days ago, Edie's sister has two daughters. Those two daughters named Allison and Anna Lauren. Allison is the older, Anna Lauren is the younger. And for five, almost uh, almost 10 years, Allison... Uh, has been struggling with lupus and the effects of lupus, so much so that it has damaged her kidney beyond repair. She needs a kidney transplant. She's been on dialysis for, uh, you know, forever. And she's been looking for a kidney transplant. Anna Lauren, her sister, immediately raised her hand. Immediately. Anna Lauren said, If I'm a match, I'll gladly give my kidney to my sister so that we both can live full lives. There's always risk. And we treat that sometimes as though it's no big deal. It's just a kidney transplant. Just a kidney transplant. But yeah, Anna Lauren, in an act of love and compassion and sacrifice and kindness did what she could with what she had where she was. One of the things that opens the door for you and for me, for us, for we, to be a refreshing to others is when we do what we can with what we have where we are. You see how Peter did it. 
verse 6. The guy wanted money, but Peter said, I don't have any of that, but I can do for you what I can with what I have where I am. He said, in his heart perhaps, I believe Jesus can change this man's life. I'm going to risk my reputation. I'm going to, I'm going to put myself out there. I'm going to be bold in my proclamation. But I believe this is the will of God. I believe this is what God has orchestrated. I believe that this is what God has planned with his sovereign purpose. And so he looked at the man who was begging for alms and he said, Silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And that man's life was forever changed. He found healing, not just for his body, but for his soul. It's through faith in him that his sin has been forgiven. We see this in verse 26. We'll get there in a second. He did what he could with what he had where he was. This week, can I humbly suggest that the way we, the family of the refreshed, help others find healing and hope through Jesus is to do what we can where we are with what we have. We have a testimony to share. My life has been transformed by God's grace. Can I tell you about it? Oh, my goodness. When was the last time you told somebody how God has shaped and changed your life? That's what you got. And by the way, if you can talk about baseball or basketball or football or sales or what's at Ikea, you can certainly talk about Jesus. Do what you can with what you have where you are. It will change a life in the hands of the living God. The second thing I want us to walk away with is turn the topic of every conversation toward Jesus. We live in a land of bad news, don't we? Can we all agree? I mean, bad news is all over the place. It seems like bad news dominates everything. Every news cycle, bad news. Every newspaper, bad news. Every conversation at the water cooler, bad news. It seems like bad news wins the day. I was talking to uh, someone very close to me that I love very much and uh, going to have a, a heart procedure. And uh, he, I was talking to him on the phone. He said, he said, well, I talked to my heart surgeon and The heart surgeon said, now listen, the heart surgeon told me I have 99.1% chance of survival. I don't know if your mind did what my mind did. When he told me that, I immediately said, you mean there's a chance you won't survive? The bad news, that 0.9% overwhelmed my emotions and my mind, and I began to think, oh my goodness, you might not survive. But, but... Remember the good news, 99.1% survival rate. Isn't that how it happens for us every day? See, what we fail to remember is that we've got good news, and that good news swallows up all the bad news that this world can muster. We've got good news, and it's better news than the bad news could ever be. We've got good news, and it can change a life. You see, with Jesus, there's a 100% chance of survival. I want you to look at verse 26. Verse 26 says, uh, to Peter's finishing up his message. He says, to you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. He raised Jesus up. That means that Jesus conquered death. And if we're walking with Jesus, we conquer death. It means that Jesus is the servant who brings all the promises of God to bear on our life. And if we're walking with Jesus, then we're the recipients living in all of those blessings. No matter what this world may throw our way, nothing, nothing, nothing will ever, ever, ever be able to take away this one truth. In Christ Jesus, I am a son and I am a daughter of God. 
and I am under his protection, and I am lavishing in his provision. And he has his arms wrapped around me, and I can stand confident and secure. And because I live with that great confidence, because I am wrapped in the arms of my loving Father every day, I need to tell somebody who's far from God how that they can find healing and hope through faith in Jesus Christ, because I want them to taste the good news of life that I live in every day. I've been refreshed. I need to be a refreshing to somebody else. Today, friends, as we, as we think about what God has done for us, we're the family of the refreshed. Let's share that refreshing with others. Turn the topic of every conversation away from the bad news and toward the good news. Oh, I know it's bad at this office. I know it's tough. I know that boss is mean. But can I tell you some good news that makes it okay? We don't have the answer for every problem in this world, but we know the one who does. So let's tell them about Jesus. Let's tell them and show them and live like being part of God's family makes a difference. That I'm a son, I'm a daughter of God, therefore I live refreshed. And you can have that too. Would you bow your heads with me please? Lord God in heaven, as we finish out this morning in praise and in worship, I pray that the reality that we've been liberated from our bondage in sin through faith in Jesus Christ, that we're no longer captured in the cell of our shame because of our sin, but now through faith in Christ, we are sons and daughters of God. I pray that that truth would ring in our soul and that we would sing praise to you. We've been liberated. We're no longer in bondage. We're no longer slaves. We're sons and daughters. Oh God, may your people praise you this morning, walking and leaping and praising you. And may we commit ourselves to do what we can with what we have where we are. And to turn the topic of every conversation to Jesus. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen.